welcome and it's really lovely to see everybody. My name's Catherine Mann. I'm the Libraries and Arts Manager for Staffordshire County Council and I chair the Libraries Connected Books and Reading Group. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you to the British Library for the use of this wonderful venue. It is a real privilege to welcome you to this round table which is something that we've wanted to do for a long, long time. And while COVID did get in the way, this session now provides us with the opportunity to reflect on how reading has changed during the pandemic and how libraries can respond to this. At the Libraries Connected seminar earlier this week, Jonathan Douglas, the director for the National Literacy Trust, described how reading for pleasure is the empowerment of literacy. Reading and the loan of books, either physically or digitally, remains our core business and is threaded throughout all of the universal library offers and promises. Through encouraging individuals of all ages to read for pleasure and for purpose, libraries support the growth of a literate, empathetic, imaginative and confident society. Through reading, we want to connect people who feel lonely and isolated, we want to encourage existing and new library customers to re-engage with the physical library offer, and we want to position our libraries to support community recovery and high street regeneration. This morning's session will be for an hour and a half. We will then break for lunch before celebrating the BBC Novels programme this afternoon. There are no fire drills planned, as far as we're aware, and the toilets, if you haven't found them, if you go back out onto the landing, the gents around that corner and the ladies the other side of the stairs. So I'd now like to hand over to Carol Stump, the president of Libraries Connected, who will introduce the session and chair the programme this morning. Thank you. Good morning, it's lovely to see you all here in person. So words have a magical power. They can either bring the greatest happiness or the deepest despair, so said the great Sigmund Freud. Storytelling, creative writing and reading have long been recognised for their therapeutic potential. The use of literature as a healing method dates back to ancient Greece, when Grecian libraries were seen as sacred places with curative powers. As any avid book reader can tell you, Immersing yourself in a great book can make your brain come alive. It sounds romantic, but science is now proving this to be true. Many people turned to books in the pandemic. It's interesting to see why, but of course it's important to acknowledge the barriers to reading that people faced. During times of crisis, people find themselves faced with lifestyle changes. One of the earliest and most notable changes seen during the COVID-19 lockdown was how we consume media and especially how we read. The Independent newspaper researched reading habits among the UK public. They looked at how much people have been reading, what type and genre of top texts people have been reading, and to what extent people have been returning to previously read books. Respondents generally reported that, were, that they were reading more than usual. This was largely due to having more free time, due to being furloughed or not having to commute, or the usual social obligations or leisure activities. This increased reading volume was complicated for those with caring responsibilities. Many people with children reported that their reading time had increased generally because of their shared reading, but had less time than normal for personal reading. Reading frequency was further complicated by a quality versus quantity snag. People spent more time reading and seeking escape, but an inability to concentrate meant that they made less progress than usual. People spent more time reading, but the volume they read was less. When Peter May wrote his thriller lockdown in 2005, publishers thought the scenario imagining London shut down by bird flu was too far-fetched. But May, who has don donated his advance to those on the front line of the fight against coronavirus, has seen sales soar since it was published. Despite the early figures showing spikes in interest for content about pandemics and isolation, it appears that people quickly tired of these topics. Many respondents sought out subject matter that was at least predictable, if not necessarily comforting. Many found solace in the security of more formulaic genres, 
whodunits and other types of thrillers were often cited. Others found themselves significantly, significantly less picky about genre than they were before the lockdown. They read more and more widely. Many found the lockdown to be a great opportunity to explore things that no, they didn't normally have the time to desire or desire to read, like hefty classics that seemed too dull or heavy to bring on a commute. Unsurprisingly, lockdown also made rereading a physical necessity for some. Some respondents noted how they were unable to visit the library or browse at the bookshop for new books. Others reported that they simply wished to save money. <coughs> On the other hand, the participants who reported rereading less than normal during the lockdown period wanted to use their newfound time to seek out new topics and genres. We've invited six amazing speakers to give their personal perspectives on why reading became so important, and as a sector, we can build on this, keeping the levels of interest around reading high and reaching those who were excluded for whatever reason. So I'm delighted to welcome our first two speakers. Monique Roffey, whose stunning book, The Mermaid of Black Conch, was published on the 2nd of April 2020 and became one of the most talked about books last year. Described by Goodreads reads as a special and deep book with a lot of heart. The Mermaid of Black Conch won the 2020 Costa Book of the Year Award. The novel was shortlisted for the 2020 Goldsmiths Prize and longlisted for the 2021 Orwell Prize for Political Fiction. Monique, it will be fascinating to hear the journey of that book and what it says about us as readers. Monique will be followed by James Urquhart from the Arts Council England. With a background in, re in reading and writing, James Urquhart spent nine years as a bookseller and 15 as a freelance literary critic before joining Arts Council England in 2010. Currently, he has the national role of Senior Manager, Libraries and Literature, and is based in Nottingham. So, Monique, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. And um, I don't really know where to start. I guess I just want to follow on from this um, phenomenon of people reading so much more and uh, just sort of reflect on, on why that might be. And I guess, for me, it has something to do with the fact that we are born storytellers. Um, we've been telling stories forever. And we've amassed um, a repository of stories that are printed and also that are oral. And, um, and I reckon it's like, you know, we turn, we turn to this repository um, that humankind have like, made um, over a very, very long period of time. And in this repository, um, there are classics, there's um, comfort, there's wisdom, um, there's magic, um, and there's resonance for us all. We all learn stuff. I mean, we can read the same book that we love. For me, it's a book like Jane Eyre. We can read that again and again and again. Um, so um, I also think it's self-care. Um, and we always know how to care for ourselves. We always have an instinct about how to heal. And so you could almost say something quite witty, like, you know, books and medicine, and they're sort of, you know, we have this kind of innate ability to kind of grope or grasp towards what's going to make us feel better, generally. So um, I think there's possibly that had something to do with this sort of spike in interest. Um, uh, yeah, and in terms of my book, The Mermaid of Black Conch, um, <coughs> it had a remarkable journey. Um, it was published by an independent press on the 2nd of April 2020, um, which is basically in the eye of the first wave of, well, like in the middle of the first wave of uh, COVID-19 last year. I, I happened to be uh, clinically extremely vulnerable and I was shielding. Um, <clears throat> so there was this kind of, and it's not just me, there were some of my friends as well, in group or so, other people were um, published in April last year. It was the, the pandemic happened. It was so weird, wasn't it? It was like, is it coming? Is it coming? <laughs> it was really hard, and the government didn't know what they were doing either. And then suddenly, boom, we were in lockdown. <coughs> and um, I don't think publishers were able to predict um, what would happen. And so, books that were published in April, even maybe May and June of last year, had a similar fate to mine, which was they were. They kind of were plunged into a chasm. Um, I, I had uh, crowdfunded for publicist for the book, 
We had an Arts Council grant. Mani, um, sorry, could you use the microphone? Would you be able to use the microphone? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I know. Oh, sorry, pardon me. So, um, do you, okay, I'll just continue. So we, so the book, um, it, it had um, an Arts Council grant behind it for a book tour. I had published, I had crowdfunded for a publicist. And um, I thought, you know, for an indie press, it was going, it had, it had a fair fighting chance of being read and seen back in April. And then this sort of catastrophe happened and the book <laughs> just kind of fell into this hole, along with many, many other books that were published that month. And two things happened. One, obviously, I was crestfallen and I just thought, well, you know, nobody was interested in mermaids in April 2020. But what also happened is I did see the writing community respond in such, with such incredible generosity. So there were some really big name writers who kind of came to my rescue. Um, David Nichols, Bernadine Evaristo, Nikita Gill. People, I didn't, I knew, I know Bernadine, but she's not a close friend and I don't, didn't know the others. And they could see what was happening to us. And they did these amazing feats of, um, they, uh, David Nichols launched my book on his Twitter platform. So did Nikita Gill, Bernadine, blurb me on Richard and Judy's book club that appeared. So there, were, there was a kind of really interesting generosity of spirit that happened in the writing community. But after that was over, I kind of just sort of thought to myself, the mermaid's dead, really, it's over. She can't survive the pandemic. Um, and then she turned up on a prize list, which was the Goldsmith short, uh, short list. And then we heard about the Costa soon after, which felt like an inc I was incredulous to be long listed, let alone to win the category. And then, then the Mermaid won the Book of the Year in January, which I, I always call this the miracle, um, because it's a miracle for an indie book to get that kind of um, like touch, you know, touch. It's like the, <laughs> the, 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 the it's, a, it's just such a sort of very, very positive thing to happen. But I think any writer would find this um, an amazing, um, you know, life-changing, altering uh, uh, fortune for the book. So my book has gone from like, you know, it was basically none of the, none of the mainstream publishers knew what to do with it, wouldn't publish it. Uh, Indie Press published it, a very reputable one, People Tree Press, extremely solid, um, home of black British and Caribbean fiction. Then we tried to arm the book with the best we could um, so that it had a fighting chance and then the pandemic just went, <laughs> just like, <laughs> took, took the book off the table and many other books too, or so it felt. So I feel enormous, I mean, I, when I'm a much older person, I think I'll look back and I'll be able to be um, able to sort of sum it up better because the ride of this book and also its appeal. The other thing is, is this is a book written in Creole, English, not standard English. It's written in poetry as well. I had, I'm incredulous as well that it's had such a wide reading audience now, a broad appeal. Um, and I also think, you know, it blurs genres. So it's speculative fiction, it's fantasy, it's about a mermaid, mermaids have, everyone loves mermaids and but she's an indigenous, ancient, sort of badass mermaid, um, very different um, from, you know, what Disney's uh, presented. So I feel a huge amount of, um, uh, like, you know, respect, actually. And one more thing I just wanted to say is, um, so there is something about, um, I wonder if the publishing world is underestimating the reading world, really. Um, and this book really sort of, proves that. And I, I think there's this idea that what we need to be producing as writers is something easy and kind of nice and good and sort of mainstream and standard English and <coughs> something that's not too complicated. And my book is extremely complicated, um, packed with ideas around race and gender and otherness and um, people love it. You know, so that's you know, so it's been quite um quite interesting as a old veteran of the writing world. I think that's what all I've got to say.
Thank Sorry you. about the mic. Thank you, Monique. And I am... I'm just so glad that mermaids survived the pandemic. Um, thank you. That was, that was lovely. James, uh, can I can hand over to you now. Thank Thanks. You. I'll try to be on mic and juggle notes and not tip, tip my glass all over the floor. Uh, very, very good to be here. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be <laughs> pleasure to be back here. First time I've seen my boss in 20 months, so I'm a bit sort of ra rabbit out of the hutch. Um, <clears throat> uh, there'll be more of that. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start with a, a bit of context as to how our thinking about and support for reading for pleasure has developed um, over the last few years, but also how the Arts Council supports and values reading and the importance of that, of that reading ecology. Um, so quickly, some of our biggest literature investments are specifically focused on supporting readers. Uh, Book Trust is by far the biggest um, in, the, in, uh, in, in the literature playbook. £5.4 million supporting their, their national book gifting scheme uh, and, and programme with early years. Uh, we support the reading agency's range of programmes targeted at broad and specific audiences of all, of all age ranges. And in 2018, we also brought um, the reader into our national portfolio programme. Uh, based in Liverpool, it convenes reading groups in a range of community settings um, and celebrates the power of reading aloud and the well-being benefits of reading as a group activity. And I want to come back to well-being because that's already Monique and, and Carol have, have kind of flagged that. So bringing the, bringing the reader in, in 2018 marked a distinct shift in our focus on uh, and our emphasis on, on a stronger focus on, on reading. At about, at about the same time, we convened a round table on reading for pleasure, chaired by Sir Nicholas Sorota, our, the Arts Council Chair, which brought together major publishers, the BBC, libraries, bookshops, um, all with the purpose of trying to find ways of supporting reading, reading activities. In particular, uh, we've looked for activities that draw in non-habitual readers, uh, that stimulate an interest in the pleasures and rewards of reading for those who maybe have no books at home or no positive reading role models, um, or for whom reading might be uncool or just uncomfortable. Um, one such project that came out of our roundtable uh, conversations was the National Literacy Trust's Connecting Stories, which again, I'll come back to that in a moment. So what are the growth of interest in reading in the last 18 months? For me, rising workloads and being shut in during lockdown created an urgent need for, for mental space, um, for recovery time, which you know, curling up with a good book seemed a perfect answer, which obviously I wasn't alone in that opinion. Um, in March and April 2020, um, library memberships soared by as much as 700% uh, in some areas, even as libraries were closing. Um, and some admittedly probably regular readers were jumping on the possibility of borrowing e-books for free. Worth remembering that at this point, Amazon were, were deprioritizing shipping book stock. Um, so in that context, there were, there were limited avenues for, for replenishing your sources. Over the spring and summer, some independent bookshops began offering remote services, um, from phone and online orders um, to mystery gift boxes that could be biked around to your house if you were lucky enough to, to have an indie in that, in that context. Most libraries extended click and collect services wherever possible, uh, working around hygiene protocols. Some arranged home deliveries and offered great support, especially to the more, valuable, uh, more vulnerable customers. Uh, libraries connected. Uh, offered fantastic and, and pragmatic support for nationally to help libraries. One simple example was interceding with publishers around license arrangements, which enabled some of those family story times that happened in libraries to become online events, uh, which was massively welcomed. But as well as some of the pragmatic opportunity for picking up a book, you know, I think the sense of well-being offered by reading was a crucial factor in that uptick in, in reading habits. So the last 18 months have been cluttered with, with stress, anxiety, financial and domestic pressures, something that I'd call mental claustrophobia, um, health worries, fears for personal safety, and, and for some of us, obviously, grief. During the pandemic, I think many people found that reading has offered escape, enjoyment, comfort, distraction, reassurance, empathy, and hope. So coming to how can we keep levels of interest around reading high, and also what are the ways in which we can reach those who might have been excluded? So at the, end of, at the end of August, library footfall was around about 50% of pre-pandemic levels. Borrowing was up to about 90%. Um, E-book lending was around about 70% higher than it had been before the pandemic. So one question is, can this be sustained over the longer term if this is actually evidence of a net increase in reading in terms of e-book borrowing and physical borrowing returning to health? So at the Arts Council, we invested £300,000 in the last year to support e-book budgets. Uh, in libraries in recognition of that spike in demand. 
Um, but also in recognition of the demand of, of, of providing e-stock and the increased costs compared to uh, physical books. We'll support dialogue with publishers uh, uh, to, well, the publishing sector generally, uh, that highlights these increased costs to libraries uh, and seek ways in which we can improve access. Last October, we also invested in the UK launch of bookshop.org, um, which is an online platform that pays a large share of profits back into local bookshops. And since launching, um, that platform sold over 10 million pounds worth of books, including giving 1.6 million pounds back to high street independent bookshops. So it's something that increases customer access to books uh, and reading opportunities uh, without damaging high street um, interests, which is something that we're very, very keen to keep in, keep in mind as well. What does the foray into digital mean for place-based festivals? Uh, you know, initially hit hard by the pandemic, um, so in some cases, the pivot to online delivery has opened up potential new audiences and readers. People from the next town or city or even country beaming into to local festivals. Some who can join when the costs of travel are removed and possibly when the costs of tickets um, are removed as well. Possibly those with mo mobility difficulties or those who are anxious in public spaces or, or in, in larger crowds. Or those who've always felt that going to a literary festival or a book festival just isn't for them and who might have, have found a, a different way into that. We've supported fledgling organisations like the Big Book Weekend, which is the inspiration of writers Kit Dual and, and Molly Flat in the Midlands. Um, Big Book Weekend is an online-only festival that proactively platforms working-class and diverse writers, and its inclusive programme approach has attracted highly diverse and, in many cases, new audiences. I think these developments are really interesting for, for nourishing and attracting new and different audiences, but underlying all this, I still think there remains a strong theme of well-being which we, we really shouldn't ignore. So there are imaginative ways uh, and approaches that can tap into reading as an, as an ingredient of well-being, uh, some of which you'll be familiar with, uh, whether it's Empathy Lab, founded by Sarah Mears and, and others, or maybe the Gravity Festival, which, which the reader um, is hosting in a fortnight's time, 5th to the 7th of November. It's a hybrid literature and well-being festival, aiming to create a place where the serious problems of life can be spoken about, cried over and laughed at which for me seems a pretty good manifesto for the power of reading. What else will we do? Uh, we should seek to support organisations and individuals that are managing to be creative and effective at nourishing reading for pleasure, uh, especially with reluctant or with non-mainstream audiences. We'll continue to advocate for investment in reading activities in and out of school for all ages in support of the excellent offer provided nationally by our local public libraries. Some organisations we've supported over the longer term the reading agency you'll be familiar with, delivering its well-established targeted programmes uh, throughout the year, from quick reads to the summer reading challenge. And this year, worth noting, it, it received an additional three and a half million pound investment from the government to extend its Reading Well and Reading Friends programmes directly as a result of the pandemic, responding to well-being, uh, countering isolation. We're also investing in large-scale projects which reach people and communities that might be excluded from opt-in reading offers. I mentioned earlier the Connecting Stories project. We've allocated £2.4 million pounds to this up until April 2023, and it's specified in our, in our delivery plan for, for our 10-year strategy, Let's Create. It's a project that's located in, in 14 nationwide hubs from Hastings to Middleborough, uh, not in a straight line, that is, um, all identified by granular data development, um, uh, data that was developed with Experian. Um, so it brings together lots and lots of different data sets. Uh, it targets need down to ward level, so it can be really, really specific as to how it gets the work that it does through to um, the people that are identified most at need. Activities are engaging and accessible. They include exhibitions, walk and talk trails, residences, competitions. It has investment from lots of publishers, offering books in cash. Uh, and the partners include local libraries, schools, local authorities and health services, charities, food banks, and other organisations who are focused on on bringing reading to where people are rather than the other way around. So, in conclusion, uh, Arts Council strongly supports and, and values all sorts of things. <coughs> uh, reading and the, the importance of the reading ecology. Um, we're increasing our emphasis on reading and our funding, putting more resource into stimulating good and interesting and inclusive reading projects. There's been a resurgence of reading amongst established readers during lockdown but I think also interest in new quarters that we collectively need to sustain. Well-being and supporting good mental health are crucial, and I think we really need to pay attention to that. And we're developing work with and cooperation between libraries, publishers, booksellers, writers and readers to achieve this.
Thank you very much. Thank you, James. It's, it's really good to hear that Arts Council are going to increase the emphasis on reading. That's really good to hear the plans for the future. We've got some time for questions. I think Sarah is going to help with that. So, um, we've just got a couple of minutes for questions. So does anyone have any questions, either for Monique or James? You just stick your hand up if you do. Uh, Sarah's got a here. Thank you. Um, this is for you, Monique. Um, I'm from um, Brent Libraries, and um, you did come and give a talk many years ago on white woman on a green bicycle, and um, we'd love to have you back. Um, <laughs> and um, can I say um, how delightful it was that you won the Costa Award, but also along with um, Ingrid Purcell, because two novels set in Trinidad, and I just think that is just absolutely amazing. So the question that I had for you is you mentioned your pleasure that you got from reading Jane Eyre, and I just wondered, thinking about Jean Rhys, who wrote The Wide Sargasso Sea, which looked at the first Mrs. Rochester, who came from the Caribbean. And I just love that connection. And I just wondered what your thoughts were around that very first book and you know the link in to Jane Eyre. I mean, I hate to say, but so much has been written about these two books and how they're linked. And the genius of Rhys's critique of Jane Eyre. Is anyone following what I'm saying? Yeah. So I love both books. And I have complicated feelings about both books. I love Jane Eyre because I read it when I was much younger. And obviously it's the story of an orphan who's sent to an institution. So I went to a boarding school when I was about the same age as Jane Eyre. And um, so the orphan outsider growing up in an institution was kind of, well, it resonated deeply. Um, and it's a gothic tale of this um, abandoned wife um, sitting up in this attic prowling, this Creole, mixed race woman, yeah, so. And so you have to really think about it. And it, I mean, J Jean Reese, Jean Reese knew this woman, you know, Jean Reese, um, I'm not sure if she was mixed race, was she a white woman, Jean Reese, I think. She, she was from the Caribbean. Well, so exactly, but a Creole been, woman, yes, a Caribbean, a yes, white Creole. Sure. Yes, I'm yeah. sure she would have had black blood running through her. Yeah, head yeah, 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 sure. So I think Jean Rees um, wanted to respond to how this woman, the white, the white, you know, the, the mad woman in the attic, had been um, stigmatized as mad, and. Um, and so her response was extremely audacious, which is to write a novel from the Caribbean, rewriting a canonical work, and in its place became a canonical work in a different canon. It's just marvelous, <laughs> it's just incredible. Um, I, I have complicated feelings about White Sargasso Sea as well, because, um, well, Jean Rhys has been stigmatised as mad. Um, Antoinette de Causeway is stigmatised as mad. And I think mad women are traumatised women, generally. So it's kind of belittling the trauma that um, the mad woman has been through. Um, and a little bit of a Freudian hysteric. Uh, uh, you know, it, there's something there that's sort of unsaid as well. Um, and my character, Arcadia, Rain in The Mermaid is not a mad woman. She's not mad or white. She's not a mad white woman. Um, she just hap She's caught up in the complications and obviously living with the curse of her um, history, historical background. She can't help, she is part of the, what's left of the plant plantocracy. Um, I don't know whether I'm answering your question. I think I probably rambled a bit sideways. I love Jane Eyre because it gave me so much comfort as a child. And I love Jean Reese's response to Jane Eyre. And they sit side by side, um, powerful uh, novels, one critiquing the other. And yet, I think that there might even be room for a critique of the critique. 
<laughs> so that's a long, long, long answer. <coughs> but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, we don't actually have any time for any more questions, but um, uh, I don't know whether you're staying, Monique or, and James, for the day. Yeah, so, you know, I'm sure you'll be able to catch them at, at lunchtime. So can we just have a round of applause for Monique and Thank you. So I'd like to invite Ayub Khan and James Bartlett onto the stage. Thank you. So we've got Ayub Khan, who is Head of Libraries at, and Cultural Services for Warwickshire County Council, and James Bartlett from the RNIB. So Ayub Khan, MBE, as I said, is Head of Libraries. His interest extends to international library development with a strong focus on diversity and inclusion particularly as a former refugee himself. He has worked on library projects in several countries for the British Council. In 2013, Ayub was awarded an MBE for his services to libraries, and he is past president of CILIP, the UK's Library and Information Association. Ayub is the vice chair of the Midlands Area Council for Arts Council England. He's a member of the British Library's Public Lending Rights Committee, and he's also joined the Cultural Leadership Board of the West Midlands Combined Authority. I hope his president-elect of Libraries Connected. James Bartlett is the Senior Manager Reading Services at RNIB, with responsibility for the service that provide, services that provide accessible reading materials to blind and partially sighted people across the United Kingdom. This includes leisure reading books, daily newspapers, <coughs> monthly magazines, an extensive collection of educational reading materials and more. Formats include talking books, Braille, e-text, and an increasing amount of digital delivery, delivery alongside physical media by post. Crucial to the success of this is the support RNIB receive from many publishers who have generously donated their content to the benefit of RNIB's reading service customers. Thank you. So I'd like to invite Ayub to speak. Right, okay. Thank you uh, so much for inviting me. It's so exciting to be here sort of in person. We had libraries connected seminar earlier on in the week and so today here, so it's all basically all uh, come together. And it's the first time I wore a tie for nearly sort of two years. And I really forgot how to do the knots, just about uh, done that, so really there. Um, Sarah asked me to um, uh, uh, talk a little bit about a, uh, an article I wrote for the Bookseller magazine about a uh, reading during lockdown and a uh, sort of a, a public library sort of perspective, you know, sort of going and interrogating our library sort of catalogue and what are people sort of reading, uh, looking at the sort of book list. Um, and really I've sort of updated it, so I really wanted to talk to you about that. Because the first thing I did was, uh, when I was sort of thinking about, you know, what were people reading lockdown, what were habits, why were people reading, were people reading sort of more? So the first thing I did was, you mentioned the Public Lending Rights Committee, so, you know, basically I, uh, a member of the sort of British Library's Public Library Committee, so I rang them up and said, Look, have you got all the data that you know nationally sort of people are sort of reading? It'd be a fantastic <laughs> resource to have. But unfortunately, they were changing computer systems and things were changing. So really sort of the data was really quite some uh, time off. So what I did sort of do was started sort of looking at our own sort of catalogue, talking to library staff and also talking to some of my colleagues around sort of what was being sort of talked to you. So I'd really like to sort of start off with a bit about really the sort of um, well-being aspect of sort of reading, and they maybe talk about reading choices, what people are buying, and really what people are borrowing sort of during this sort of time. Um, we, we now know that sort of more reading was happening during lockdown, and I think that's been a uh, fact that. And Jonathan Douglas, earlier on at a library sort of conference, also reiterated the fact that, you know, when they asked people what would make you read uh, more, what would make you sort of go back to reading, and the first thing that they basically said was, more time and all of us had a lot more time during sort of the, the, the lockdowns uh, but I think there's a bit more to it than just having more time while reading sort of levels um, are really sort of rose and people reading more and I think reading is a real uh, stress buster 
fears of infection, social isolation, jobs and money worries, and perhaps homeschooling raised levels of anxiety across the adult population. Even shopping for sort of groceries became worrisome, ordeals of wearing sort of masks, hand gels, hand, uh, hand wipes and social distancing really sort of raised the sort of anxiety levels, uh, both for adults and children. But also children too felt stressful, effects of a normality eroding, you know, we've seen all these statistics in terms of mental health and sort of children. According to the reading agency and Debbie sort of here, 55% of children reported feeling stressed when schools closed and 60% were worried uh, about relatives might uh, fall sick. The Reading Wild campaign reported in December 2020 that an estimated one in four children were feeling an uh, anxious. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that reading makes us feel better. It's a popular cultural pastime, as we've just sort of heard in terms of the work that the Arts Council are doing around sort of reading. And it has positive measurable impacts on our health and well-being. The stress-busting effects of evidence of reading across the sort of, uh, uh, age range uh, was really sure or demonstrated in this National Literacy uh, Trust sort of report that uh, Jonathan mentioned earlier on in the week. Uh, they basically surveyed more than 50,000 9 to 18 year olds. Um, and what they sort of report is that nearly 60% of them felt they felt better uh, for reading during lockdown. So these are statistics, you're all in the articles, and can sort of provide some of this. So what, what were people reading and what factors affected their choices? That's what I was really trying to get out from this article. Um, some studies divided reading lockdown into two camps. Those that like to read uh, comfort, reread familiar old favourites, and those who prefer to use their bonus reading time, if you call that, to experiment with different authors and genres. Whether shielding, uh, furloughed or otherwise stuck at home, we had more time to visit, uh, revisit books that we loved. Two-thirds of respondents to the May 2020 survey said that reading interest, both fiction and non-fiction, had changed. So just before I talk to you about reading sort of in libraries, what, what, were, what, were, what were sort of buying choices? What were people buying uh, before we sort of looked at sort of there? Uh, anecdotal sort of evidence suggests early interest in books about disasters and epidemics soon waned, and readers wanted to escape the grim <coughs> reality of the global sort of pandemic. A quick look through the various bestsellers on this showed a mix of crime, thrillers, fiction, autobiographies, cookery books, again, talking about sort of, you know, books saying that you were at home and DIY books were sort of amongst the top. Many of us, it seemed, whilst feeding our minds <coughs> with books than usual, also went down the lockdown journey of home baking, uh, bigger sort of waste and also DIY sort of projects, uh, but also books on health and well-being and home-based activities such as gardening were really being sort of there on the top, top there. Mm -hmm. Escapism, again, featured strongly on the top titles for children. Bestsellers included fantasy, adventures, comedy titles, uh, along with... Sorry, sorry about this. Along with... Uh, puzzles and joke books. And a few familiar characters, such as, you know, Harry Potter, Stick of the Dog and Spot, were all sort of the sort of favourites there. According to the Publishers Association, audio book downloads were the fastest growing format, popular with both children and adults. Book sales surged during lockdown, and the upward trends continues through 2020. More than 200 million printed books were sold in the UK, the best performance for many years. So that's incredible. More books were being basically sold than any sort of time in the last few years when people think really sort of, you know, books sort of habits were sort of dying away. So borrowing choices. Public libraries offer the alternative, alternatives such as free, click and collect, you know, we've just sort of heard about book loans and home delivery to shielding readers. 
feedback was very positive. The Lucky Dip selections, the titles hand-picked for customers by librarians were popular and encouraged readers to explore new authors and genres. Customers in Warwickshire showed a preference for happy endings and books about uh, hobbies, outdoor activities, and help with homeschooling and sort of DIY. So I asked the staff, you know, you put these bags together, what are you sort of putting, what are customers asking for? And that's what they were saying. Meanwhile, library authorities saw a substantial increase in sort of digital. Um, and according to library sort of connected research, e-book rose by 146%, e-audio by 113%, magazines and by 80 and newspapers by 223%. So that's huge. And these are some new figures that were sort of released by you sort of quite uh, recently. Warwick shares adult borrowing figures for the first 12 months of the pandemic restrictions make interesting reading. The top five most borrowed printed titles were different to the five e-audio sort of titles um, loan featured on the sort of list, uh, with over 500 downloads sort of simultaneously on offer. Print and digital borrowers showed somewhat different sort of tastes during lockdown, but trends emerge across all formats as one library staff from our stock services. So what she said to me was, Christine, crime and thriller always issue well, but during the last year, we've noticed an increase in romance, escapism and mood boosting loans, plus well-being titles have been incredibly popular. We also noticed popular revisiting all favourites books that have always meant a meant to read at some time and the perennial bestsellers the classics were issuing sort of well so i said sort of well what were children sort of reading what were we doing in terms of children's reading what were those books so again we went into our library catalogue to find out what uh, reading sort of habits were there and clearly some parents sought to mitigate the effects of lockdown uh, limitations on young children's sort of development by uh, borrowing lots of sort of books to help with sort of literacy but the five sort of uh, top picture books or titles in Warwickshire uh, included The Gruffalo Child, The Hungry Caterpillar, We're Going on a Sort of Bear Hunt, so you sort of basically <laughs> familiar sort of titles across there. And Harry Potter titles took the five uh, places for younger readers and Eid Audio Charts and Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, uh, the most downloaded ebook. And we've got to remember that obviously some of the restrictions were sort of lifted, so you know we were allowed to have a lot more e lending. As well as availability, Warwickshire Star say why the sort of lockdown exposure contributed to the popularity. Authors such as Liz uh, Punchone, Julia Dominson and David uh, Williams also provided online content free uh, for libraries. So those really helped a lot with the sort of loans. And what was really interesting was Warwickshire Schools Library Service reported a boom in requests for teachers for sort of real books. I went during the sort of pandemic and we were allowed to support um, schools uh, for homeschooling uh, and those that were, 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 were basically uh, of key worker children's school so when I went to schools library service there was masses of green boxes of loans and a, there were sort of hundreds of them and basically what the staff there were saying was that head teachers were really really keen to get real books uh, in the hands of uh, key worker children in the school because there was so much online sort of reading sort of going on and that they were worried about sort of the time that children were spending on screen so they really wanted that so that was really sort of an interesting so sort of will it sort of last it's it's difficult to predict whether the pandemic will have a long-term effects on customers reading habits and trends uh, browsing which sort such a big part of normality sort of times was severely sort of curtailed so what's really interesting was we were basically in libraries choosing books on behalf of our customers or customers were choosing books from the library catalogue and that browsing part had sort of disappeared so it'd be really interesting when the public lending rights figures come out to see how's it going to fare with future years when customers are coming into libraries themselves but what we found is that physical borrowing 
borrowing is sort of continuing. We're about 70 to 80% uh, uh, up in terms of our reading from pre panic days. So basically, we're basically only sort of 20% sort of down from 2009. So really, re reading sort of levels and book borrowing is sort of continuing to go up. And hopefully, by the end of the year, we will have reached uh, levels that we had in 2019. Um, and so that's it. And our digital borrowing is sort of continuing to sort of go up, something like 20,000 downloads uh, a month. So we are seeing a sort of continuous something. So basically, I'll sort of leave, leave it there. I could sort of go on so much more, but uh, <laughs> we'll you. basically, uh, some of the questions might come up later. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I have some really interesting facts and figures. I'll hand over to James. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as was mentioned, so I look after RNRB's reading services, and we provide Braille and talking books to over 50,000 customers who are spread throughout the UK. And we do this by a mixture of sending stuff through the post, articles for the blind, and increasingly we offer a digital online service. And so in the past year, we have sent out 1.4 million books to our readers, and that's across USBs, CDs, physical Braille books, and all variety of digital download. So as, as I'm sure you've all experienced, when COVID first emerged, we had to close our physical circulating Braille library because we wanted to assess the risk of, you know, when you read a Braille book, you actually have to touch every single cell on every single line. And we weren't sure about what the risks at that point, because COVID was such an unknown quantity of what the risks of uh, infection might be. Um, at the same time, our customers were finding themselves very much like everybody else, but particularly, um, you know, accentuated. They were at home, they're very isolated, um, they had no visitors, the trips out that they may have done um, ceased, and they had two key concerns. First one was getting food, because they were no longer going to the shops and having sighted assistance, somebody to go around and describe to them everything that they could buy, and they were finding that time was weighing very heavily on their hands. And as we know, mental health you know, it can be heavily impacted when you have too much time um, not occupied. So we were looking at how we could react to this. And so RNIB did an awful lot of work with supermarkets to get priority shopping slots for people to make sure they had the food that they needed day to day. But at the same time, on the library side of things, we moved to producing fresh Braille books for people. So we were like embossing on demand. So when somebody received a book, they were the first person to read every single one of those pages and touch that braille. And if you're an experienced touch braillist, you know, you can actually tell whether something has been read before by somebody else or not. Um, just checking the time. So alongside this activity, uh, we worked with publishers to get their permission to include their audio books on our radio station. So RNIB has a connect radio, which you can get uh, on on the internet, you can get it on your digital TV, it's in one of the higher numbers, and we were able to put out books on there as well at a, at a sort of a reasonable hour. And we provided free subscriptions to our newspapers and magazines because what people were really hungry for was the latest news, what was happening, what were we hearing about COVID, not just the headlines, they wanted to read the in-depth and understand what it meant for them. So we were working in every way we could to keep people supplied with the reading material that they were asking us for. And obviously, alongside that, we were still sending out huge quantities of our talking books on CDs and USBs as well. Now, you might have thought that we were ahead of this. Uh, just the month before, in February 2020, we <coughs> launched our brand new online reading sap service. Um, we had no idea that COVID was arriving, and we had spent you know, the last two years working on this. Um, this new platform was much more versatile. Not only could we put talking books on it, we could have put Braille on it. Uh, and I'll come back to the Braille in a moment. And our customers, you know, driven by adversity, it pushes people to find new and different solutions. So our, whereas our previous platform had about four, four to 5,000 active readers on it, our new platform has now got to 13,000 active people using it. And I think part of that is driven by people having overcome their inertia, their usual cycle of things. They were looking at other ways to, to read books. Um, so what are the lasting impact of this? Well, we've now moved fully to a Braille on demand service. The books that we provide to people, they're smaller, they're lighter, they don't have great big heavier plastic covers on, which is another helpful thing because we're not adding to the plastic 
um, in the environment challenges. And it's strange enough that just two years ago, we met the Dutch Library for the Blind just across the other side of the Euston Road. And they've been doing this for the past 10 years and they're explaining how and why it works. And in the course of the conversation, they said, and of course for, um, for cleanliness and for hygiene. And uh, my, my manager and I looked at each other and we thought, cleanliness and hygiene? We thought, you know, we, we were aware of some of the issues that could come back. But not did we realise until COVID impacted just how much resonance that that throwaway comment from them was going to have. So now we produce fresh Braille books for all of our customers. And interestingly enough, our Braille readership, our active Braille library customers, have been steadily declining year on year. And we had just gone below 1,000 active borrowers. And in the last year or so, we've actually increased back to 1,300 and more. Um, in asking people why have they come back, they said, not least, it was because the big books, the plastic covered books, were too hard to handle. Um, a lot of our audience, although we serve people of every age, the majority of them are retirement age, of the third age, and they were finding dexterity issues handling the big, big books, and they were too heavy on their laps, too heavy to turn around. Um, and you have to bear in mind, you know, if you take a Harry Potter book, you know, I know they're quite a solid book in print, if you have it in Braille, it fills a bookshelf. And they're not, you know, they're not the size of the books that you've got sat there beside you on the chairs. You know, these are big tomes, you know, bigger than an A4 <laughs> piece of paper. Um, so it was, it was fascinating to us that we've actually been able to turn that around and regain um, some traction with our customers, which is fantastic. You know, a 30% increase in your, your active customers of a very specialist readership is just brilliant. I mean, I started in Braille when I started at RNIB, and to have that, that pick up from people is just um, amazing. But alongside that, uh, I'm just looking at the time. Time does whiz by when you're sat here, doesn't it? Um, I may, it does for me, it may not for you. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've done increasing amounts of e-browse. So much as you might read a book on a Kindle, we are now providing books electronically. So on an SD card, we can now supply people with a library of thousands of books and when I started at RNIB, an electronic Braille display cost the same as a Ford Escort car, around eight to nine thousand pounds. And I remember at the time being absolutely staggered. And now we can supply people with an electronic Braille display for about five hundred to six hundred pounds, whereas an equivalent car is around twenty or more thousand. So you see the difference in the course of thirty years. And these work—they've got electronic pins that go up and down. So you read a line, you press a button, the pins drop down, and the fresh line comes up to read again by touch. And I have spoken to people who are lifelong Braille readers who've said they've read far more Braille with their orbit than they would have ever managed with, by reading a physical book. So again, it's empowering to people. And we've given away over 300 Braille readers to people, and we're about to embark on a further round of that. Um, I haven't really touched on our talking books. We, has, we send out an immense amount of CDs and USBs to people. Uh, it's our biggest service by far, over 40,000 active borrowers. But what has been exciting for us, two months ago we launched a smart speaker skill. So people are no longer waiting on the post to arrive. And I don't know about what it's like where you live, but where I live, everybody in my local Facebook group is complaining about the, the randomness of when the post does and doesn't turn up. Well, if you're waiting for your next book to arrive, that, that is quite a significant thing to be waiting for. And now people can actually call the book uh, on demand. And I had mentioned that our audience uh, were much of the older age group. I was talking to a lady the other day, and at the end of our conversation, she said, she was a, she's got an Amazon Alexa. She said to me, you do know how old I am, don't you? And I, I mean, I'd kind of guessed she was about 70 from the, the bits we were discussing. She said, I'm 100. And you know, you kind of go, oh, Okay. And I think it just exemplifies age is not a barrier. It's about the confidence and willingness to give something a go. You know, it's, it's not an age thing. It is about being prepared to give it a try. So I just wanted to final, finally say, I read our customer feedback every month. And the thing that has stood out to me through the pandemic is I, you know, quite reasonably, I expected our complaints to grow. People were saying to me, send us more, send us more. What has actually grown has been our positive feedback. People saying to us, you don't know how much this means to me. And the word I read every month from customers, not my word, but their word is, it's a lifeline. Mm -hmm. And to be able to provide that to people, you know, 
is, is the most amazing thing to be involved with, to be providing that to people who say, otherwise the days are endless and empty. I'm reading a book, it gives me the escape. And actually just, you know, the point you made about the books of interest, family sagas is what people have really relished reading. And I think, you know, they've been very removed, remote from family, from human contact, and it's been heartwarming to them. So I'll finish there, but thank you very thank much. Thank you, what a valuable service, thank you. Thank you both. I think we've got time just for one question, if somebody's got a question for Ayub or James. The fascinating talks from you. Um, I wanted to ask, Ayub, in 2020, the other big story was Black Lives Matter, and I wonder if that had an impact on Bookland. Um, I don't think there was... <coughs> um, obviously, looking through the sort of uh, catalogue in terms of borrowing sort of history there, uh, Black Lives, I don't think necessarily uh, featured because there's so much of a time lag in terms of uh, people accessing resources, new sort of books coming in. So I'd imagine, you know, when I said that the, the top uh, digital loans were newspapers, and I'm just wondering is whether a lot of the content that they were reading was around sort of the Black Lives sort of matter sort of movement and so sort of what was going there. So I think a lot of that would have probably been digital there. But what I, we didn't sort of see a trend then, a lot of people going out there and by, uh, uh, borrowing lots of uh, interest in terms of uh, black black history uh, authors uh, from uh, minorities and sort of black, black, black people sort of from that point of view. So it'd be interesting, maybe next year, we might see that evidence sort of appear uh, across that a really interesting sort of point. Thank you, <coughs> great question. Thank you. Thank you, Ayub and James. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. So um, next I'm going to invite Debbie Hicks from the Reading Agency and um, author Sophia Ahmed up to the stage. Thank you. So Debbie Hicks, MBE, is a founder member and creative director of the Reading Agency. She has responsibility for programme development and delivery, cultural strategy and policy planning, creative innovation, research and evaluation. She has been the inspirational driving force of the reading and health work of the Reading Agency, including creating Reading Friends, a UK-wide reading befriending programme focused on combating loneliness. Safar Ahmed worked in advertising and in the House of Commons before becoming a full-time author. In 2010, she set up the BIBI Foundation, which arranges visits to the Houses of Parliament for children from underprivileged backgrounds. Sfai has written several children's books, including Under the Great Plum Tree, which was endorsed by Amnesty International and long-listed for the UK Literacy Association Book Awards. She has also contributed an essay to It's Not About the Burqa, Muslim Women on Faith, Feminism, Sexuality and Race, edited by Mariam Khan. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. Fantastic to be here today. Um, and I'm really, great, really pleased to be able to not only celebrate the novels that have shaped our world and all the fantastic work that's gone on around that, but also um, the reading that saved our lives, basically, during a, a very difficult time of deprivation and challenge, restoring us, um, Enriching, enriching our worlds and connecting us at a time when uh, social connections were really difficult. At the Reading Agency, we're, we're absolutely passionate about the proven power of reading. We know uh, from the work that we do with our library partners, but also from the research and evidence that we gather, that it really can help to tackle big life challenges, building skills and learning, improving health and well-being, and connecting individuals, families and communities, all really key areas of need that have been absolutely amplified during the last 18 months. 
But we're also really, really passionate about our special and long-standing relationship with public libraries and the way that working together, we can enable massive engagement with the benefits of reading, particularly for those vulnerable and excluded communities that need those benefits the most. Public libraries can reach people that are hard to reach and out of reach for other services. During lockdown, it's absolutely true to say that our physical lives got got smaller and smaller, but our reading lives got bigger, opening up new windows to the world, providing escapism and relief, teaching us new things, and inspiring big conversations about important topics. Just from my own personal perspective, my reading journey has taken me into the future with Ishiguru's Clara and the Sun, into the past with Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet, around the salt path with Raina Wynne, and to the Caribbean uh, with Monique's amazing story of the mermaid and Ingrid, Ingrid Poseid's Love After Love. And these are just some of the amazing places and people that I visited when we couldn't visit anywhere. So reading has been a lifeline for me, but for those most in need, whether it's been children missing school and struggling to catch up, or the lonely and the isolated, its benefits have been even more significant. At a recent webinar, which some of you may have attended on the library offer for people experiencing homelessness, a representative from The Big Issue said that when vendors were surveyed at the beginning of the pandemic about, about their needs, what were their needs most, you know, what did they want support for, it was interesting that along with essential services, books came top of the list. And at the same time, the journalist Maeve McLennan uh, author of No Fixed Abode, who was also talking at the seminar, told a very, really moving story about the escape and comfort that books have provided for a young refugee at her time of greatest need, helping her to uh, feel connected, but also to improve her English and find her way in a new world. So these are just some, some personal stories, but they're absolutely backed by evidence. And you've had a lot of stats today, but I'm just going to share a few of them. Um, from, from, from the work that we've done. So our 2020 World Book Night research indicated that one in three people read more during the lockdown they, than they did before. Um, but interestingly, there was a particular spike in young people's reading, with 45% of young people saying that they were reading more. Nelson's data indicates that 30% of adults were reading more print books, 20% were reading more e-books, and 9% listening to more audiobooks. But again, there was a spike in young people's consumption, with one in four young people listening to audiobooks more during lockdown than they did before. We've heard about reading as a way of relaxation and escape, and that was re very clearly has come through in the evidence and cited by lots of people as the reason they picked up a book. One in two adults said that reading provided much needed entertainment and a way to pass the time. Young people and children said that having more time to listen to audiobooks provided a welcome distraction, had a positive impact on their well-being, and helped them to relax and sleep. And the wider evidence completely backs these findings, with regular readers reporting fewer feelings of stress, stronger feelings of relaxation, and a greater ability to cope with difficult situations. Given the focus on escapism and, and relief, um, as we've heard, it's not surprising that fiction um, was a very particular uh, genre of choice um, during uh, the first lockdown, with crime and the classics especially popular. But as we've also heard, books about ap epidemics, The Plague by Camus and The Viral Storm by Nathan D. Wolfe also saw massive stale sales, perhaps, perhaps less escapism here than learning through the experiences mm -hmm. of others. And then there was a return to comfort reads and an increase in rereading and reading books with formulaic plots. Obviously, we needed our books to be a safety blanket. As we've heard, books, uh, book sales spiked during lockdown with one in four adults buying more books than before. And whilst libraries closed, as you know, there was a massive increase in online borrowing. We, we know that one third of the UK public engaged with public library services during the pandemic and that they made 3.5 million more e-book loans than, than usual during March to August. So there's no doubt that all this reading helped to open up closed world 
world and connect people at a time when they needed it most, with 41% of adults saying they felt lonelier than before lockdown and one million people becoming chronically lonely uh, between April 2020 and February 2021. Um, reading groups known for generating a sense of community flourished and moved online, and our shared reading programme delivered with Public Library's Reading Friends delivered massive reach and impact. We were set a target of delivering 16,000 reading befriending engagements between January and March, and public working with public libraries, we delivered 70,000 reading-inspired conversations online and by telephone. Um, and this, this book chat really did make a difference to people. So 85% of Reading Friends participants said they felt less lonely as a result. 83% felt more connected to other people. And 74% said that they'd had added purpose to their week. And it absolutely was a lifeline for many people. Uh, there's one particular example of, of when a library, um, a, a library member of staff was uh, on a Zoom call with someone who really did take ill during their reading befriending conversation. And they were able to uh, get some support for them at a time when they had no one else to talk to. And if reading is good for you, so is library use, with 60% of people surveyed by Carnegie saying that the engagement with libraries had a positive impact on their well-being and made them feel more connected to their community and less alone during the pandemic. So in the midst of really challenging and difficult times, reading has provided a lifeline to many, including some of our most vulnerable communities. But there are challenges. Digital reading and book lending services have not been available to all, particularly the elderly and those living with disadvantage. And we know that existing inequalities have only widened and become more entrenched during the pandemic. There's also been a widening of the gap in reading enjoyment and daily reading engagement between boys and girls during this period. But all in all, I think it's been a success story and there are strong foundations on which to build. So, how can we retain this momentum? We've learnt a lot during the last 18 months about digital value, scope and challenge, and the importance of new, blended ways of working that combine the best of online and face-to-face -face delivery. We've seen the massive engagement and outreach potential of quality assured reading for pleasure and empowerment programmes, such as the Summer Reading Challenge, the Reading Well Books on Prescription programme, and Reading Friends, delivered by public libraries into local communities to feed creativity and enrich lives while supporting skills and learning, health and well-being, and social connectivity. So to ride the wave, I think we need to keep on doing what libraries do best, providing free and democratic access to diverse reading content alongside physical and digital reading opportunities uh, to celebrate reading, expand reading choices, share stories, and connect over book, book talk. It's been tough, but I think we now have a really important story to share about the proven power of reading to change lives and the power of public libraries to help ensure that its life-changing benefits reach everyone, particularly those that need it most. It's a really powerful story, so let's take this opportunity to tell it. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Some really valuable evidence about the power of reading in libraries there. Thank you. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying how delighted I am to be part of the event. Um, thank you for the invitation. I was asked to um, say a few words on the growth of reading in children and young people during the last 18 months, how we can keep that level of interest up, and how we can reach children that have been denied access to books. Research, I'm sorry I've got stats as well, um, published by the National Literature Trust, shows that children and young people have turned to books in this pandemic. The 2021 annual survey's key findings are that children's reading was raised from 47% pre-lockdown to 55% post-lockdown. And it's important to note that children's reading was at a 15-year low before lockdown. In the 2021 research, more than a quarter of children said they enjoyed reading, a third said they were reading more, and they're reading adventure, comedy, fantasy, and real life stories. Research also showed that reading supported children's mental well being and enabled them to dream. 59% said reading made them feel better, 31% said reading helped them when they felt sad, 
and 50% said reading encouraged them to dream about their future. The National Literary Trust's research has also, also shown that the gender gap in children's reading habits widened during lockdown. Audio books were popular with boys. 51% of boys said audio books increased their interest in reading, and 43% of boys said audio books made them more interested in writing. So perhaps audio books can be used to keep boys interested in stories. Not all children's books are given the option of audio by the publishers, but perhaps that data could convince publishers to use this medium more. I also wanted to talk about access to books. Um, and I wanted to begin by telling you about my access to books when I was a child. I grew up on a London council estate with strict Asian parents in the 80s. The estate was made up of blocks of flats with a children's park and a public library tucked in the centre. The library was the one place where my mother allowed me to be on my own as a child. I like to think of the estate library as my happy place. I spent Saturdays and entire summer holidays in that library. I don't need to tell a room full of book professionals how access to the shelf of books opened new worlds to me and raised my aspirations, you all know. During lockdown, a young footballer made headlines with his campaign to feed hungry schoolchildren. A little later, he spoke of reading and books and how no one had ever placed a book in his hand. Marcus Rashford said, There were times when the escapism of reading could have really helped me. I want this escapism for all children, not just those that can afford it. I have to admit that when I read those words, I wept a little for that small boy who could have escaped his reality for a little while each day by diving into an adventure or a mystery or any other type of story. And we know that today there are so many children that do not have access to books. Although the pandemic increased reading for many, there were children from low socioeconomic backgrounds who were denied books because of the closure of schools and libraries. And even before lockdown, there were permanent closures. We know that 800 public libraries have been closed since 2010. School libraries are closing too. I call up schools to offer author visits. And the number of secondary schools that no longer have a library space is depressing and wrong. So how can children from low socioeconomic backgrounds access books? I've already mentioned the National Literacy Trust research, which showed that use of audio books increased during lockdown. Perhaps audio books and e-books might be one way to go forward. The bricks and mortar building may have gone from some high streets, but the books are available to access online. Perhaps if there are more children's e-books and audio books, an effort is made to promote the public online uh, library service to children, they would use that medium. It would keep children reading. I myself used the Libby app um, during lockdown, um, religiously went through which children's books were available on there, and very, very few. Uh, just, you know, the, really, the ones that you would find on the supermarket shelves. But in terms of range, you know, hardly anything there. So maybe effort can be put into that to make, you know, to give children that, that access. But of course, that doesn't mean that we pull away from print and just go the digital way. We have to dig our heels in. Uh, this was li linked into that bit it said about working in Parliament. So, and fight for the physical uh, public spaces for books in education. There is the wonderful campaign by the Children's Laureate, Cressida Cow, to put primary school libraries at the heart of the pandemic response with 100 million yearly investment. I myself am a big supporter of the Great School Libraries campaign, which is led by SILIP, SILIP School Libraries Group and the School Library Association. I do believe that there should be a legal requirement for all secondary schools to have a library. It is crucial to children's learning. One final thing to say uh, from a personal angle, something I feel passionate about when it comes to children's reading, and that is that stories are for everyone, regardless of the author's heritage or the skin colour of the main character. We should really challenge the idea that a book written by a certain type of author is for a certain type of child. The book should only ever be about the genre. It's a horror story or an adventure or a crime-solving mystery. I do believe that books should be displayed according to genre and not the skin colour of the author. It is crucial that inclusive books are placed in front of white children. Books dispel stereotypes and offer a more balanced view of the world, especially those children who grow up in a homogenous environment. I have visited schools in parts of the country where I have been told that I might be the first person of colour that the children have ever met. To me, as a Londoner, that was mind-boggling the first time I heard that. But that is the reality in so many parts of the country. Stories are for everyone. The whole point of books is to create empathy, to walk in another person's shoes, 
but children will only pick up a book if they feel it is a story for everyone. And those of us who promote children's reading need to be clear about that and to promote that. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. That was really interesting to hear about your experience, particularly as a child, and, and the journey you went on with the public library as well. So it's really good. Thank you. We've got time for one more question for Debbie or Sophia. If anyone's got a question, anyone got a question? Isabel. Really fantastic. A lot to process from both of those. Um, so it's a question uh, for you, Sophia. Um, we've heard a lot today about... It's very interesting, I think, that reading is both a solitary activity, but it's also um, a communal activity. And we heard, I think, especially from Monique when you were talking with, with Sarah, really interesting about how there's a connection between the reader and the author an author and another author. There might even be you know, a century or more between those authors. And also, Monique, you talked about that uh, sort of treasure trove of stories that may go back hundreds and hundreds of years. So obviously in lockdown, we were all cast back upon ourselves in solitary reading. But I wonder, as an author, how you're looking, you know, looking forward. What do you think the future is for um, how the more communal and connected reading might operate as we move out, hopefully move out of this dreadful pandemic? So how, how uh, sorry, I'm not quite sure I understood the question. Like, how do, how is it community? Yeah, so in, obviously in lockdown, we were all cast back upon um, solitary reading. Right. And so there wasn't the chance for us to read in groups or together or okay. to meet authors face to face. Although there was obviously the growth of some of that happened online. Yeah. Um, but now that we're moving out of the pandemic, I'm mm. wondering as an author, if you've seen, has that, the future of that connected communal reading, do, do you think that's changed? Um, I think what, what I'm looking forward to is just to be able to go back to schools and do author visits. They are, I'm saying this is an author and it pays my bread and butter, <laughs> but um, they, are, they are so important. Um, it's so important for children to see authors. Um, I mentioned that I've been to parts of the country um, where I might be the first person of colour that they've come across. And interesting, I mean, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but what I did notice, and I've been doing this for the last um, eight years, since I got published. And I noticed that after Brexit, sort of 2017, 18, 18, 19, suddenly I was getting more bookings in um, areas that I'd never visited. So I was going into sort of pockets in Hampshire, um, you know, other parts of the country, all white areas, um, also low socioeconomic backgrounds as well, where schools felt that me coming into the school uh, would contribute in a positive way. Uh, for the children's learning. Um, so I just said I'd go on off tangent, then I did. <laughs> but um, but uh, I think, you know, in terms of children's um, cl class reading, reading aloud, you know, that, that, that makes a huge difference. Um, and, and as I said, um, author visits, hopefully. Did you want to add to that, Monique? Because did you want to add to that as an adult? <laughs> I've always been aware that there's this kind of circulating idea or myth that, that the novel is dead, that books are dead, that that you know they're going to die, that that the ebook is going to kill. I've just heard this like for 20 years now, and it's just like a sort of it's like fake news. It's not true. Um, I'm so I feel so buoyed by the fact that I've been writing for 20 years. That I'm mentoring emerging writers from the UK and the Caribbean who are going to write for 20 more years as well. They've got a future in books. Like, we like this. It's not going away. So the future, the good news is, is that books are going to have got a fairly... Um, you know, the future is, is fine, it's safe for books. They're not going to, we're not going to go away. No, and I don't I think we should be scared of the digital at all. No. I mean, my royalties for my... You know, they make a difference. Yeah. Um, and it also means that people... I mean, they're cheaper as yeah. well. Audio books as well, and if they if the research is showing that audio books make a difference to boys being interested in stories, yeah. that's huge. 
You know, that's something that publishers be, should be jumping on. That's something that all those campaigners should be pushing the publishers. But, that but boys I, are reading, boys yeah. are interested. This is just a, a, a medium, you know? The whole yeah. point is the story. I mean, I, I've got a friend who was reading Anna Karenina on his phone. And that, to me, is like the intersection between what the digital era, uh, what the digital era can do for us, which is, you know, you're reading a classic that was written, I don't know, 100 odd years ago by a Russian man, you know, sitting in the car park waiting for your daughter to come on the next train. So it's just an amazing... It's, it should be creatively em embraced by creatives. And it's always one type of person that says a novel is dead. Yeah. <laughs> one gender, yeah. one age group. <laughs> so. Yeah, It's never been more alive, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting question, Isabel. Thank you. We're, we're, we are at lunch, but just before, um, just for each speaker, and we've only got a few seconds each for this, um, we'd like you to tell the audience about a book that you are longing to read. So, Debbie, I will start with you. Okay, so I'm going to have two. I'm, I'm longing to read one of yours, Sophia, so I'm going to... Right, so I'm going to read uh, Under the Great Plum Tree or Secrets of the Hannah Girl, but I'm also going to reread... Hamlet, because, um, you know, it's a long time since I've read that book, and reading Hamlet has made me want to go back and revisit it. Wow. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Um, so I want to read um, a, a book by uh, the children's author Anjali, Anjali Ruff. She just had a book released last week, which is called um, The Lion Above the Door. Um, and the reason I'm really keen to read that is um, I really believe that classrooms can be more inclusive if we are more inclusive of our history. Uh, the book is about, she's looking at hidden histories, about the contribution that the people from the empire made in the world wars. Um, and my book, that it's, it's not a plug, I promise, um, <laughs> is Noreen Isanayat Khan that has been so generously donated today, bought today, um, is, is about a World War II heroine, uh, Churchill spy, Noreen Isanayat Khan. Um, and, you know, it's all, Basically, all I'm saying is that um, hidden histories, um, we need to bring them into the classroom. And I'm really, really excited about Anjali's book. Um, and she's a great writer. Thank you. Ayub. Right. Uh, the, book I want, can you hear this? Yeah. The, the book I want to read is called The Vegetarian by Han Kang. And I had it there, but somebody said it was a really dark story. <laughs> uh, it's set in sort of modern-day Seoul about sort of... Uh, a young part-time graphic sort of designer has this sort of real sort of weird sort of nightmarish dream uh, around sort of animal sort of cruelty and it's a really sort of dark and I didn't want to read it during the pandemic it's sort of sitting there <laughs> and I'm sort of just waiting now we're out and meeting other people so I really want to go and sort of read that because I've had uh, colleagues who have said to me that's absolutely amazing book and I said is it good or no and they just wouldn't give me an answer whether they really liked it or they didn't so that's something I really want to go back to and read. Thanks, I have Monique. Um, the book I want to read is called The Lip by a young Cornish... It's a debut novel by a young Cornish writer called Charles Carroll. And I actually met him recently at um, the inaugural Falmouth Book Fest, which was a blast, and it took me five hours to get there. But when I got there, I was lucky <laughs> enough to meet all these um, local writers. And Charles and I were chatting away, and he's like, oh, I've written this book called The Lip. And I was like, ooh, what's that about? And it's told from the point of view of a young woman who's literally li living in a caravan park on a cliff, which they call the Lip. And um, it's just an untold, not often heard story of like working class poverty, Cornish life, told by you know an up and coming writer. Just ticks so many boxes for me. It's just like yeah, I want to read that. Um, the Lip, Charles Carroll. Thank you, James. So the question gave me some pause for thought, really, and I think the book I'd like to read is A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr that uh, was printed in, 19, came out in 1980, and it was won the Guardian Fiction Prize and was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And I'd have to give the context, I've read most of his other works, and they're quite droll and very funny, and I enjoyed those. And a 15-year-old me struggled a little bit with this book, and I think 40-odd years later, I'd like to look at it afresh and see what I think of it now. So, uh, yes, A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr. Thank you. And James again? Uh, so I, I think probably I, I've got a couple, but um, at the moment I'm halfway through reading Archipelago, which is one of Monique's early, earlier books, and it has this lovely kind of, as well as a mermaid theme, which um, I'm really enjoying, 
uh, it, it's, there's, there's a looping reference to Moby Dick, uh, which has been sitting on my Kindle, it's partly read, page 53, for about, for about five or ten years. Um, and it, it, Money's book reminds me, actually, of a, a brilliant book by a woman called uh, Senedieta Nasland, who wrote a book called Ahab's Wife, um, which was about Ahab's wife, and it was a massive book, because uh, Ahab's wife is only mentioned in about two lines of, of Moby Dick. And all these kind of, it seems to have come together. It makes me think, oh, now's the time I need to go back to it. So it's going to be Moby Dick. But something slightly more recent, I'm really interested in the book of shortlists. So, um, and in particular, uh, I think Richard Power's bewildered uh, because of the, the climate fiction kind of current vibe for me. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much. And can I just finally say, it's been so wonderful to listen to um, the speakers. They've been absolutely great. It's, it just gets you that back, that interest back in reading, and, and it's been just wonderful to hear your, your take on that. So can we just say thank you very much to all the speakers. <laughs>